in the a human body, in the liver and in the heart, two very complex organs, there's 24 different types of cells that we have to categorize differently because they are so different. In the brain, there are thousands of different categories of neurons that are not at all similar to other neurons. And so there's thousands of different categories. And uh, of course, that adds to the further complexity uh, of it. If we were to take a look at the schematic of one of those neurons, uh, there at the dendrite is what receives chemicals on a receptor. Uh, and that receptor has to be trained to receive a certain chemical. Then an electrical signal goes down uh, that nerve and then that it results in chemicals being released in the terminal button, and then those chemicals then are received in another dendrite, and this is how your brain communicates. This is how uh, neurons fire from one uh, to another. And if we were to take a look at this area of communication, it's known as the synapse. Uh, the synapse is the area that every pharmaceutical company is wanting to develop a product to manipulate. Uh, because uh, this, again, is where communication occurs in the brain. And, of course, many pharmaceutical companies have come up with chemicals that do manipulate the synapse in some way, shape, or form, and then try their products and then try to get them released on the market as an antidepressant or an anti-anxiety drug or uh, something to uh, help uh, with psychosis, uh, etc. If we were to add up the synapses, in the brain, the average neuron makes a thousand connections with other neurons. Uh, so one neuron influencing a thousand others, that's the typical. However, you see the cell there that's demonstrated on the screen, that's called the Purkinje cell. The Purkinje cell is one of those categories of neurons uh, that, of course, is different. But that Purkinje cell makes 200,000 connections. So one neuron firing can influence 200,000 others. And if we were to add up all of the synapses in the human brain, it turns out that the conservative estimate is 100 trillion synapses. However, new evidence shows there's probably 10 times as many more than this. And so that makes even the American national debt seem small. Uh, in comparison with the amount of connections that you have in your two and a half pound brain. And uh, so this, uh, this organ, of course, is wonderfully complex. And, uh, you know, uh, the Bible give, gave us an indication of that. The psalmist in 139 said, I will praise thee for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Marvelous are thy works. And the Living Bible states this. Thank you for making me so wonderfully complex. And some of you males thought it was just the females that were complex. Uh, actually, the males are complex as well. Uh, they also have brains that have these types of synapses and billions of cells, uh, uh, etc. But the psalmist goes on. It's amazing to think about. It's amazing to think about how wonderfully complex we're made. Your workmanship is marvelous. And how well I know it. Well, whenever you have something this complex, it shouldn't be surprising that things can go wrong with it. Have any of you ever owned a computer and worked with it on a regular basis and had it for several years and nothing ever went wrong with the computer or the software that was installed in that computer? All right, we even have honest Macintosh users here today. Normally, there's a Macintosh user that will raise their hand and try to act like nothing ever went wrong with their computer. Uh, but uh, I own a Macintosh as well, and I can tell you uh, that if they're really working with it regularly, things can go wrong, even with a Macintosh computer. And, you know, if things can go wrong with a computer that's a lot more simplistic, it shouldn't be surprising um, for us to realize that things can go wrong with the human brain. Let's take something even more complex, the space shuttle. Have things ever gone wrong with the space shuttle? Yes. And sometimes the things go so wrong that it is devastating. And deaths occur, and billions of dollars are lost, and explosions, etc. Now, for those who followed the space um, shuttle missions, 
and were scientists in charge of that space shuttle mission. I've actually heard them lecture uh, from time to time. I'm, uh, of course, I'm quite interested in scientific and engineering feats like this. I've always had an interest. Uh, in fact, I, uh, I would love to give you a whole presentation on how the space shuttle actually works. It's fascinating uh, to go into um, the, um, uh, what is actually occurring there. But the space shuttle scientists tell us that every mission, there were things that went wrong. There wasn't things, that, things did not run perfectly on any individual mission. Now, of course, some of those things were minor enough that they didn't, of course, cause devastation. Uh, but uh, uh, when we have something that complex, we need to recognize that things indeed can go wrong with it. And let's not be shocked and surprised uh, necessarily when those uh, types of things um, occur. I remember my father, who is a mechanical engineer, uh, teaching me early on that when things started to go wrong with mechanical things, he would just stand back and say, too many moving parts. Uh, and, uh, you know, in reality, uh, yes, when you have all of that motion and a lot of moving parts, there's a lot of opportunities for things to go wrong. And the things that are going wrong in increasing numbers today are common mental illnesses of depression and anxiety. And that's what we're going to be talking about here in the next uh, two days. Uh, one out of four people in Great Britain has a diagnosable mental illness. And most commonly, it's depression or anxiety, but it could be obsessive compulsive disorder, which actually, by the way, is an anxiety disorder. It could be post-traumatic stress disorder, which is an anxiety disorder. It could be phobias or panic disorder, uh, which also is classified under an anxiety disorder. It could be major depression. It could be bipolar depression. Uh, it could be uh, a psychosis, some form of psychosis. Uh, and, uh, and so there are uh, just, you know, if you, uh, if you take the train or the subway in, even those that are functioning out in society, many of them, a high percentage of them, of them have a diagnosable mental illness. And so when we recognize the prevalence of mental illness, we need to, we need to very easily recognize that if you yourself don't have a mental illness, you know someone who does have a mental illness. And so uh, you either yourself have one or you know someone with it, and that's how common it is. Uh, and so those are really the two categories of people as we look at them, those of us who, uh, who have a mental illness and those of us who know someone. I know someone tried to correct me one time and said there's a third group of people and those are people that cause others to have mental illnesses. Uh, but, uh, but in reality, they would still fit into uh, to one of those uh, two groups. If you want to learn more about the brain, one of the ways of learning more about it is to read what Ellen White wrote about the brain. There are two volumes called Mind, Character, and Personality, and in the first volume, she starts out her book on the first page with this, to deal with minds is the greatest work ever committed to men. To deal with minds, the greatest work ever committed to men. And what you are going to have the opportunity to do at this, uh, at this uh, a particular camp meeting, um, if you participate in the, in the small group afterwards, is to really learn how to deal with all minds and to all backgrounds and hopefully you'll be able to also uh, deal with your own. Uh, we do uh, 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 make one large international uh, a travel period every year. This, this year, um, it's here in England. Uh, but uh, I can tell you, based on our schedule, uh, our chance of coming back here to England is extremely small in the next 10 years with all of the other requests uh, that are there. Uh, and. Um, and so uh, it's good to be able to pick up uh, what you have an advantage of now. Depression and anxiety, finding and treating the cause is what we're going to be talking about. And this is, a, this is what is getting ready to be published in the medical literature, the forerunning of this program. First of all, let's go in to a little bit about depression. Depression is often spoke of as the most common uh, mental uh, illness. 
the number of people developing depression worldwide has steadily increased since 1915. That, that is utilizing the same criteria for diagnosis. It's not that we've changed the criteria. But every successive generation since 1915 has had greater rates of depression. Major episodes of depression now occur frequently by age 25. Now, when I was growing up in the 1960s and early 1970s, I remember I didn't grow up in a medical family. As mentioned, my father was, was an engineer. He was uh, one of the chief engineers for General Motors. Uh, and so I grew up in Detroit. Uh, but uh, there would be people that on our street that would begin to suffer from this. And I would say, you know, what's, what's going on with Mrs. McPherson down the street? And the answer that came back was she is suffering from a midlife crisis. That was the term that was utilized for major depression, midlife crisis, because it tended to occur, you know, in your 40s, 50s, um, thereafter, et cetera. It was very rare in the younger age groups at that point in time. We don't call it the midlife crisis anymore. That's not the lay term for it. It might still be utilized on rare occasions simply because major episodes of depression are occurring at a much earlier age. Overall, the risk of depression has increased over time, however, in all age groups. So even the elderly have a much higher risk of depression uh, than they did a generation or two ago. The lifelong risk of depression that is published now, but it's going to have to be revamped, is that one out of four women will suffer from it at some point in their life. Now that is speaking of major depression only. Sometimes major depression is called endogenous depression because it seems to come from within. It's not something necessarily that occurs because you went through a divorce or you failed a test. Uh, those types of things uh, can produce um, what's called exogenous depression or sometimes called situational depression. And of course, situational depression can progress to major or endogenous per, uh, depression. But major depression seems to come from within. However, a recent study done on high schoolers in the Western world shows that the average female now graduating from the 12th grade, we call it high school in America, I learned yesterday from speaking to your youth, that you actually call it college. Uh, you know, uh, I guess uh, you're utilizing, we utilize terms, I guess, in the later stage. We don't talk about college until after you graduate from the 12th grade and you enter a school where you pay money, et cetera, and get higher education, uh, and that's called college. And then university is when you're getting your PhD and your advanced degrees, uh, et cetera. But, uh, but here, I know you call college high school, and then when you start college, you call that university. But nonetheless, if, if we were to... Uh, <laughs> uh, if we were to... Um, uh, look at individuals that graduated from college here, it's one out of four chance that a female will already have suffered from endogenous depression or major depression. And that means they have double that risk. And so really the new publications that are going to come forward are going to talk about a one out of two risk. That is extremely high and extremely common. In men, it's one out of eight, and we're going to have to uh, uh, progress that to one out of four, because one out of eight boys, by the time they graduate from high school, will have already suffered from endogenous uh, depression. However, if we look at the, at the lifelong risk of all forms of depression, from major depression, bipolar depression, and what we call situational depression, it actually is much higher, because None of us will necessarily recognize. If you live long enough, you are going to be suffering from some significant and serious losses. And one of the things that we train individuals in our training program to be able to train others is how to grow from losses instead of being blown away by losses. But I'll tell you, this is a very important ingredient in regards to how long you live. Uh, first of all, the statistics. 99% of people by age 70 will suffer at least a short episode of situational depression at some interval as a result of serious loss. I'll just give you an example of how um, uh, important this is. This, was probably, this started to happen before I really developed all of the mental health um, 
uh, uh, programs uh, that, um, uh, that we're kind of highlighting here in the next two days. But uh, my first book, some of you are familiar with, is called Proof Positive. As an internal medicine physician, uh, I deal with a lot of diseases like high blood pressure and coronary artery disease and cancer and these types of diseases. And uh, we wrote a book called Proof Positive, How to Achieve Optimal Health and Reverse Disease Through Nutrition and Lifestyle. And uh, after I wrote that book, I was asked uh, in many places to go and, and speak on, on summits. And so there was a, um, a proof positive um, health summit that was being held in East Texas. And I was asked to be the speaker of that. And uh, there was a lady It was also open to the lay public. And so there was a lady from the East Texas community um, who was turning 100 that weekend and she came with her pen and paper taking notes on how she could become a healthier human being. <laughs> 100. And uh, uh, when she came out, you know, because she didn't go out in public a whole lot, but when she came out, um, some people that were friends of the news media there, the, the channel uh, news, uh, called the news station up uh, and, and told them, you know, this lady is turning 100, it would be a news event, she's kind of well known in the community, and, uh, and she's at this Proof Positive Health Summit. And so the news anchor decided that they were going to go buy her a birthday cake, and at the lunchtime, they came with the cameras flashing, and they had a birthday cake for her to blow out her candles. And, of course, they wanted to interview her for that segment of the evening news. So they put a microphone under her chin, and the, and the news anchor said, Tell us, ma'am, what's special about being 100? And the woman just quips right back and says, No peer pressure. <laughs> and I started to think about that, and uh, I actually started to talk to her. She was a very interesting woman to talk to. She could tell us when the first automobile pulled up into her town and what was said about it, and who was saying this and that, and, and some of the you know, erroneous things that people would say about automobiles with this new machine, et cetera. And she could tell us about uh, you know, all sorts of historical facts of what had happened in that area uh, you know, as an eyewitness. Uh, but uh, I started asking her, I said, you know, think back to when you were 40 years of age. Did you... Uh, do you, I mean, close friends that you had at age 40, any of those around now? She thought back and she said, no, not a single one. I said, how about when you're 70? And you know, she had already lost children to diseases of old age. She had lost her husband years earlier. And um, she says, you know, that's 30 years ago. She said, close friends at age 70. She goes, I did have a lot of close friends, but none of them are here now. And what I realized is this woman had learned how to grow from losses. She was not blown away by losses. Yes, she went through grieving and she went through mourning. But she processed those losses and was able to develop new friends, new routines, etc. And how healthy you are as you age has a lot to do with how you experience loss. And so uh, we can't uh, necessarily underemphasize uh, that point uh, as well. However, let's go back to major depression. Major depression affects 350 million people worldwide, up to one in three people who see an internal medicine physician. And I'll just tell you, this is how I began to get involved in major depression. I'm an internal medicine physician. Now, internal medicine, what that means is you're, uh, you deal with adult diseases of the internal organs. Well, the brain is an internal organ, so of course we learn some neurology and psychology as well, but of course we're the ones that are called in when the patient is critically ill. I still do a lot of critical care work, although I'm trying to back away with all the other things that I'm doing. Uh, so I brought in some critical care specialists, but I still have to cover for them on weekends, and occasionally patients want just me to take care of their critical ill family members, so I still am involved in it to some extent. But internal medicine physicians are the ones that try to put everything together. The cardiologist wants to diurese the patient and get rid of all the water. And the kidney doctor is want, wanting the patient to have more water and more fluid on board. But the patient has heart disease, et cetera. And so it needs an internist or a critical care doctor to, to manage all of this and to look at all of the systems and put it together. Uh, but I, would, uh, I taught in a residency program teaching uh, the specialty of internal medicine uh, years ago. 
And I would teach my residents to learn the common disease as well. I wanted them to learn congestive heart failure as good as a cardiologist. Why did I want them to learn it that well? Common disease. The number one reason for admission to hospitals, congestive heart failure. And they're going to be seeing that just about every day of their life. And so they need to know it as well as the expert if they're seeing it that often. I wanted them to learn gastroesophageal reflux disease as good as a gastroenterologist. Why is that? 50% of the population will suffer gastroesophageal reflux disease at some point in their life. And they'll be seeing that, at least on an outpatient basis, on a regular basis. Pneumonia, one of the primary reasons for admission to the hospital, I wanted them to learn it as good as a pulmonologist. Now, when I would tell my internal medicine residents this, they would often cringe and say, that's a lot of information. You know, and that, that's a subspecialty. Cardiology and pulmonary, those are subspecialties. You do internal medicine first, and then you just branch off into one particular area. And, uh, but... I can tell you it's a limited amount of information, and it's still something that they could learn. And afterwards, when they would learn it, they would thank me profusely. I still get letters from my residents. Thank you for demanding I know it this well. Because what would happen is when the cardiologist then saw the patient with congestive heart failure, after the internist had seen it, the cardiologist would tell the patient, you know what, that internist has done everything that I would have done, and possibly even more, you need to stick with that doctor. He really knows what he's doing. And so their reputation really goes up in the community. Now, I don't want the internist to know Guillain-Barre syndrome as well as a neurologist. Why do I not want them to know it as good as a neurologist? Guillain-Barre syndrome, they might see once in their lifetime if they're lucky. And if they do, they'll recognize something is significantly wrong, and they can get the subspecialist involved in that. So they don't need to necessarily know every disease like the subspecialist because they can't learn all of those diseases when they're putting those things together. But they can learn the common disease as well. Well, after I began teaching, not began teaching, I'd finished teaching, and I was in, in private practice, uh, where I still have the Nedley Clinic in Ardmore, Oklahoma, an article crossed my desk from an internal medicine journal called the Archives of Internal Medicine. And it stated that up to one in three people who see an internal medicine physician has major depression. And the first thing that struck me is common disease. Do I know this as good as a psychiatrist? And I had to admit that I didn't. But I was also practicing in the South. Studies show people in the southern part of the United States are happier than people in the northern part of the United States. And uh, we'll get into maybe some of the reasons for that. And I was thinking, you know what? It's not one in three in my area. In fact, I don't think hardly any of my patients are depressed. And so I probably don't need to learn this. But then I thought, you know what? I better not just assume that. I better do the screening test. So for the next uh, couple of months, I had every patient that was seeing me in an outpatient practice fill out a screening test for depression. And I found out it wasn't one out of three, but it was one out of five. And one out of five, is that still common? Still very common, and I'll, I'll have to admit, it was re with reluctance, but I had to, you know, at this point, after drilling my residence, I, need, I recognized that I needed to, to uh, follow my own teachings, and so I recognized that I needed to learn this as good as a psychiatrist, and so what I did is I sat at the feet of preeminent psychiatrists, um, the, the top psychiatrists in our state and some from other states, learning about depression and other common uh, illness, uh, mental illness, anxiety. And what I learned from these um, psychiatrists, well, what do you think it was that I learned from them? I learned a lot more about the medications. Psychiatrists are experts in using high doses of drugs that can affect the synapse and using it in combinations, et cetera, to be able to get an effect. So I learned more about the medicines. I already knew a lot about them, but not as much as a psychiatrist did. So I learned about the medicines. I learned about their side effects a little more. I learned about their interactions. And I also learned better how to diagnose it and differentiate it from other mental illnesses. And so there was much that I could learn from the psychiatrist. But after I had learned what I could learn from the uh, psychiatrist that I rotated with, I recognized that something was missing. And, uh, and well, I'll get into that here in a little bit, but let's get, get, get to the impact of depression. 
The World Health Organization now states it's the leading cause of disability worldwide. People are more likely to miss work over depression than any other single illness. But they're also less likely when they call in sick to identify why they're calling in sick. In fact, I've been an employer for 20, uh, over 25 years and I have yet to have a patient call up in the morning and say, I'm not showing up today, I'm depressed. Uh, they'll give another reason, but they won't necessarily give that reason, uh, et cetera. But then, of course, the, mate, the bouts of depression can get so severe that it starts affecting their ability to function. And we can also, of course, pick these people out in the workforce and recognize what's happening early on. And in the United States, this is old data, it's going to be updated here in the next year or two, but uh, $90 billion spent in treatment, disability, and lost productivity in the United States uh, each year. Well, let's get into what is uh, major depression. These, this is the Psychiatric Bible's criteria. The Diagnostic, Diagnostic Statistical Manual, Volume 5, just came out and was released. Um, it's a worldwide manual that's called the Psychiatric Bible, and it, it stayed the same as the dsm 4 as far as depression is concerned. Uh, that was one of the few things that didn't change in this manual. Uh, but you cannot have recently faced obvious emotional trauma, but you will still experience five of nine symptoms for at least two weeks. What are those symptoms? The first one is deep sadness. Now, the Psychiatric Bible also states that you will have symptom number one, you qualify for symptom number one if you feel emptiness. Now, you don't have to feel sadness or emptiness all the time. You just have to experience it the majority of the time, that means over 50% of the time, <coughs> during your waking hours for the last two weeks. Now, females, as you noticed, are diagnosed more with depression than males are. And one of the reasons why females are diagnosed more is they have a greater tendency to feel the sadness. Males have a greater tendency to feel the emptiness and when women feel the sadness, the deep sadness, there's a likelihood that they are going to experience what symptom as a result of the sadness? It's called crying spells. And what will happen um, with the woman that's depressed is something will go wrong in the day that she would prefer not to have happened, and then she'll notice that she's crying over that. And then the next day, something will happen, and then she's crying over that. And she recognizes, you know what, nobody died. It's not that sad. Why am I crying? I know this wasn't good that it didn't happen. I preferred it didn't happen, but why am I crying? And so the woman will go to the doctor and tell the doctor about the crying spells. And so depression is then diagnosed, and then what's the next thing that the doctor does? writes out a prescription for an antidepressant drug and says, you have major depression, you have a chemical imbalance, and you're probably going to have to take this drug for the rest of your life. And um, that is, um, is what typically happens. Now, men feel emptiness. Uh, they can feel a sadness, too, and men can get crying spells as well. It's not, it's not completely um, you know, divided there. And women, of course, can feel the emptiness. But Men, as a result of feeling emptiness, will feel that it's just a normal part of their existence at that phase in their life. I can tell you it's not normal to feel sad or empty the majority of the time. If that's happening, that's distinctly abnormal. And that's symptom number one. Symptom number two is apathy. Now, apathy has to do with interest. Uh, the individual with apathy will wake up in the morning and not really be interested in the day's activities. The person will get up out of a sense of duty and responsibility, but not interest. And as a result, the interest can drop off to the point where the person actually does not experience pleasure in things that used to be quite pleasurable for the individual. And of course, that's an advanced form of apathy. And, you know, it, it may be normal once in a while to wake up and get, out of, get up out of a sense of duty and responsibility. But if that happens, the majority of the time, that is distinctly abnormal. But yet many people will put up with this symptom thinking that it's just a normal part of their existence. 
at that phase in their life. And it's not, it's distinctly abnormal. The third is agitation. Now, symptom number three, you also qualify for, according to the psychiatric Bible, if you have a slowing of your muscle movements. We call it psychomotor retardation, is the term in the, uh, in the medical literature. And either one of those qualifies for symptom number three. Now, symptom number three is the one that the individual himself or herself often don't recognize. As far as the slowing of the muscle movements, they won't recognize they've slowed down unless they see a video of themselves walking across the lawn at a family reunion, and then they see that video again and they say, is that me? I look like I'm depressed or something. I mean, I didn't know I was walking that slow. It almost looks like something's wrong with me. Uh, and so they won't recognize it. Uh, they'll have to ask others or see themselves on a video. And the irritability they often don't recognize. I can tell you in the, in the office, it's very helpful to have the spouse there. Just last week, I asked a patient, are you more irritable than you used to be? And he says, no, nah, no. Nah. And the wife is there in the corner saying, <laughs> oh, yes. And uh, I said, you know, your wife is disagreeing with you. And the wife came up with three instances that had just happened in the last week where he flew off the handle and lost his temper, where before he hadn't lost his temper in those type of situations. So then he looked at me back and says, you know what, she's right. I guess I am more irritable than I used to be. I didn't really recognize it. And so you need some help on symptom number three is what I'm saying. Don't assume that you're not more irritable. Ask some close associates of yours and they'll be honest with you if you tell them to be. Uh, sleep disturbances. Now, what's the most common sleep disturbance in those with major depression? Okay, uh, keeping late nights. Uh, that's not necessarily called a sleep disturbance, although it probably should be. But it is true, people with depression tend to, tend to be nighttime people. They tend to continue to go to bed later. And uh, one of the reasons for that is sleep deprivation in a person with depression will dump a chemical called serotonin from neurons, making the person feel less depressed. So they actually kind of rev up as a result of sleep deprivation. The problem is they eventually have to go to sleep, and when they do, they wake up a total zombie and just, um, you know, almost like the walking dead uh, in the morning. And so it's a kind of a vicious cycle, and it's one that we'll talk about how we can get rid of that um, cycle uh, rather easily. But uh, the most common, uh, uh, anyone else on a common sleep disturbance? We haven't identified it yet. Uh, not being able to go to sleep, uh, we call it insomnia. That is pretty common. Uh, that's where it's time to go to bed. You go to bed and you can't go to sleep. Fairly common in people with major depression, but not the most common sleep disturbance. Sleeping too much. Uh, we call that hypersomnia. And by the way, there are individuals with hypersomnia that would also qualify as a sleep disturbance. We, we have a program for treatment-resistant depression. Uh, that we run uh, for the most severely depressed individuals and most severe anxiety individuals in America. And uh, there are people that come to that program every time that are sleeping 18, even 20 hours a day. They're barely awake long enough to survive, you know, to be able to get nutrition and be able to keep themselves clean enough um, to have survivability. And so they're totally, at this point, they're totally dependent on others. They're totally dependent on others to clean their house. They're totally dependent on others to even bring in food, etc. Their houses look like war zones, you know, where a tornado's gone through. You can, it can hardly walk through it, etc. cetera. Uh, and um, it's a pretty sad state of existence. But uh, that also is not the most common sleep disturbance. The com most common sleep disturbance is what we call early morning awakening. This is where you go to sleep, but then you wake up too early and can't get back to sleep. So first you have, you know, you're supposed to get up at six in the morning, but now you're waking up at four and not being able to go back to sleep. And then as the depression gets more severe, you'll be waking up at two in the morning and not being able to go back to sleep. And so uh, that's the most common uh, sleep disturbance. And no matter which sleep disturbance of those you have, that qualifies. 
Uh, number five, weight or appetite changes. What do you think is the most common weight or appetite change for those with major depression? Is it weight gain or weight loss? It is weight gain is the most common. Why is weight gain common in people with major depression? It's called self-medicating. And they self-medicate with what's called comfort foods. And what are the most common comfort foods that an individual might self-medicate with? All right, you've identified it. One of the big ones is chocolate. Um, sweet foods in particular, they'll tend to do soda pops as well. You know, if you want to do a screening test for depression outside your local grocery store, watch the cans of soda pop leave and which families are carrying out those cans. Uh, soda pops actually do um, improve, they not only taste good, but they improve serotonin levels transiently so the person feels less depressed. But eventually there's a nadir that occurs and that serotonin level now goes down lower as a result of eating the sugary substance. Chocolate has a double whammy. It not only improves serotonin levels transiently, but it also improves dopamine levels transiently. And uh, then it, again, it produces a, a um, nadir or a trough in those levels. And so it sets you up uh, for that cycle of addiction. Do you know what percent of the female population is addicted to chocolate? <laughs> this is according to the strict definitions of a true addiction. 40%. What percent of the male population is addicted? It's 10%. Uh, so it's still there, but not as common in males as it is in females. And uh, you know, the, uh, uh, about a year ago, I, was, um, I have privileges at a hospital in, um, in California close to Weimar. My Nedley Clinic is in Oklahoma, and I'm president of Weimar. And we run the treatment-resistant program at Weimar. And uh, when I was uh, there, um, uh, interviewing uh, to apply for privileges at the hospital, the president of the hospital um, was very interested in what I was doing with depression. And I noticed that he left a seat next to me vacant. And uh, that was the seat for his wife, who was late for the dinner. But as soon as his wife came, um, uh, he says, um, you know, Dr. Nedley is an expert in depression and deals with that. So her first question out of the box, she goes, oh, that's, that's great, I'm really interested in this. And she pulls out, out of her purse, this bag of chocolates. And she says, if I don't get a piece of this every 20 minutes during the day, I crash. Now, she was a beautiful woman. She was starting to get overweight, but she at least limited herself to a little bit every 20 minutes. And she says, I have no idea how to get away from this. Uh, and of course, she needed to get to the root cause of depression, which we're going to be speaking about here. Now, weight loss and anorexia can occur when the depression is of sudden onset and if it's severe. So if it's sudden, severe onset, you'll tend to get anorexia and weight loss. But either one of those will qualify as symptom number five. Symptom number six, lack of concentration. Now, this can occur uh, to the point where the individual uh, even kind of goes into a panic in regards to what to wear for an evening event due to lack of concentration, but it also tends to affect grade point average. It'll, if you're a college student, you'll notice that you're having to study more and your grades are starting to go down. You'll have trouble remembering what's at the bottom of the page, or I should say what's at the top of the page that you read when you get to the bottom of the page. Uh, and that's simply due to lack of concentration. It can get to the point where you're not even digesting what the evening news is showing as you have the television on, et cetera. So you have um, inabilities that start to surface in regards to uh, efforts at concentration. And this is quite common in those with depression, one of the reasons why it needs to be treated promptly. Symptom number seven is when the depression starts to get more severe, feelings of worthlessness will uh, begin to surface. Symptom number eight, morbid thoughts, also when the, the disease gets more severe. Now what are, uh, what would be an example of a morbid thought? Okay, uh, suicidal thoughts um, is, uh, is one, um, and um, suicide is, uh, is, is far too common, and suicidal thoughts are pretty common, so that would be a morbid thought. 
Fantasizing about someone else's death is also a morbid thought, and you'd be surprised how many severely depressed people fantasize about a loved one dying. I'll, I'll just be honest with you, some uh, uh, particularly, uh, but it, it's happened with men as well, but particularly women will believe, it's, it's a false belief in many cases, but they'll believe that their depression is induced by their spouse. And they don't know how to get out of the marriage well. They're depressed. They're having problems decreasing in concentration. And so they'll actually fantasize about their husband dying, which they think will release them from depression. Uh, that's what's called a morbid thought. Uh, now, having said that, once they go through our program, uh, the amazing thing that happens is when they get um, uh, reintroduced to their family, they'll write back and say, I have the most wonderful husband in the world. Now, the husband hasn't changed at all but their mental health has changed, and as a result, they're seeing things from a much more accurate uh, perspective. Now, having said that, I should also mention that some relationships are so bad that that is a factor that's involved. However, it's a factor far less than you might recognize. Many people with depression assume it's the relationships causing the depression, and one of the things you need to understand, if you have depression, you have relationship consequences. Everyone with depression will have relationship complications, but that doesn't mean the relationships are the cause. And if we start manipulating relationships when that's not the cause, what's going to happen? The depression is actually going to get worse and not better. And then someone mentioned uh, self-harming. Uh, and we do have individuals in every one of our programs that have uh, or are self-harming. They're cutting themselves, uh, et cetera. Uh, but actually, the, the, the strict definition of morbid thoughts is preoccupation with death or symbols of death. Have you noticed the t-shirts and the tattoos, etc., that have symbols of death on them? Skeletons, etc. You know, just coming over here from uh, St. Albans um, yesterday, uh, we stopped at uh, one of the fuel stations on the, on the M6. And um, uh, going to the restroom there, I was just noticing the public that was coming in. And actually, 50% of them, I counted them up with the 80 people that walked in there, 50% of them had some sort of symbol of death on them uh, as they were walking to that restroom. It was, uh, often it was T-shirts with this major skeleton. There were tattoos, etc. It's not normal. Those, what's happening is the fashion industry is taking advantage of the depression. And as a result of the depression, people are identifying with these uh, uh, symbols of death and buying them up. The other day, um, or last winter, my son uh, was going to buy a snowboard. I was actually going to get it for his birthday. We like to ski and snowboard in the wintertime. And as he uh, chose the, uh, was choosing the snowboard, he turned it over and he says, Dad, I don't want it. And I said, why is that? And he says, look at this. There's this white skeleton on the back of the snowboard. And so they're even putting it on uh, things of that nature. So if you're identifying with those things, distinctly abnormal, morbid thoughts, um, chalk it up. Number nine is a symptom I tend to see probably most common in my practice of internal medicine. That's different than interest. Symptom number two was, was apathy. Symptom number nine is fatigue. And that's when you run out of energy. Uh, and so um, you just recognize you don't have the energy levels um, that you used to. Uh, and you might have it in the morning and run out in the evening, or you may not even have it in the morning, and that's when it gets more severe. Now, depression, you have to have how many of these symptoms? You don't have to have all nine. You just have to have five of nine, and that's major depression. Now, if you have two of nine, it's still abnormal. It's thought to be possibly normal to have one of these, but to have two of these, it's called minor depression. That's the difference between minor and major depression. The psychiatric literature calls it subsyndromal depression, uh, but that really is the same as minor depression. Now, depression would be bad enough if it uh, did those things, but unfortunately, it does a lot more. It increases the risk of stroke by 50%. It increases the risk of sudden cardiac death in those who've survived a heart attack by two and a half times. How long you live after a heart attack is much more related to your mental health than even what heart medicines you're taking. And that's why it's recommended anyone with heart disease take a screening test for depression. Increases the risk of heart disease in men. Increases the risk of death 
from cancer in both genders. It increases the risk of death from pneumonia due to the, its effects on the immune system. Pneumonia is still in the top five causes of death uh, in England and in America. And it also increases the risk of suicide. Now, I should have um, looked up your suicide statistics. I will before the end of the week. But I'll just tell you a little bit about the American statistics. It's the eighth leading cause of death in America. Third leading cause of death in young people ages 10 to 24. And, uh, you know, it is amazing uh, how many individuals, you know, healthy individuals physically are deciding to take their own life, particularly among the young, twice as frequent as murder. Now, I know Europe thinks that um, uh, murder is far too common in America, which it is. I agree with that. But for every murder that occurs in the U.S., twice as likely to have that gun pointed at the own individual and to take your own life, either through a weapon or other means. But it's far too common. And unfortunately, suicide, maybe, you know, there's some reasons for this, but suicide is under the radar screen. When someone dies of suicide, they end up in the obituaries. They were born this day and they die this day and nothing else is stated about it. And so, unless it's a very famous individual, uh, you won't find out. Uh, necessarily that it's suicide, and so it stays under the radar screen even though it's twice as common as murder. Murder will make the headline, suicide won't. Feelings of hopelessness is the best correlate of imminent suicidal action. And uh, one of the things, if you're putting on a program like this in your community, a depression recovery program, uh, just putting on that program will save lives in your community because people will recognize that there is hope. Uh, they maybe have tried the most common forms of treatment, medicine. They maybe have tried the regular, you know, psychotherapy lines, and they're going to find out a hundred different ways that they haven't tried that can help their mental health and their depression significantly. And so they'll, and these are very simple things that they can do. So uh, they will begin to have a lot of hope as a result of coming. Other factors on suicide are impaired judgment. Over half of individuals who commit suicide have a frontal lobe suppressant drug on board. What's the most common drug on board? Alcohol, actually. And so uh, many of these individuals will have alcohol on board suppressing their frontal lobe or another a drug. Impaired coping skills. Coping skills are at an all-time low in the Western world. We found this out through tests. Uh, we'll uh, give scenarios to students. Um, say that your mother dies and your girlfriend breaks up with you and this happens and that happens. What would you do? And there's, you know, A through E, and E is suicide, and many of them are choosing just as an imaginary scenario that they would just go ahead and end their life. Uh, and so coping skills are at an all-time uh, low, and that's something that we're going to be talking about. Impulsivity. Uh, in, uh, not too far away from Weimar is the city of San Francisco. And San Francisco has a bridge called the Golden Gate Bridge. How many of you have heard of that bridge uh, here in Great Britain? It's a beautiful bridge, 400 feet off the water, just has a four-foot fence line. It's a major highway going over that bridge. And one of the most common ways, or I should say a fairly common way of committing suicide in San Francisco is making that jump off the bridge and smashing on the water and instantaneously dying. However, one psychiatrist took a look at the 20 people who had survived the jump. Over 1,000 people have committed suicide. And by the way, there's an argument in San Francisco going on right now, should we spend millions of dollars to increase the fence line to save lives? Uh, and it would be a, a multi-million dollar project, and California's bankrupt right now, so they really don't have the money for that. Uh, but the, um, uh, the 20 people that survived the jump happened to jump or land on the water just right. Most of them landed directly on their heels, straight down. And they suffered compression fractures. Some of them suffered a loss of limbs. Uh, they virtually all ended up in ICU, even though they did survive. They ended up with pneumonias, etc. So their life completely worsened as a result of their jump. And they were just asked a simple question. Three simple questions, actually. The first question is, do you wish you would have been successful in committing suicide? What do you think they answered? They answered no. They said, we, are, um, uh, we really do not want uh, to end our life. In fact, 
Um, we're very glad we survived. So their life worsened, but they're very glad they survived. Then, just to be sure, they asked a follow-up question. So you realize you made a mistake by jumping? All 20 of them said, yes, we realize we made a mistake. Then the third question was this, when did you first realize that you had made a mistake? <laughs> Two-thirds of them said, as soon as my feet had left the bridge. So it demonstrates the impulsive act of suicide. A lot of people think that someone who's committed suicide has somehow had a comprehensive review of their life and made an objective decision on their own behalf. Not true. It's a very narrow viewpoint, and it's very impulsive. And right in the midst of the act, often the individual is saying, uh-oh, I don't think I should have done this. But for over 99% of them, it was too late. Uh, and, uh, and their life uh, ended. So here's the enigma of the medication industry. Those, individ those the most commonly prescribed medicines on the planet for depression actually worsen impulsivity before they improve depression. And that's why they have big black box warnings warning you that if you take this antidepressant, it might increase your risk of suicide. Now, after you take it a while, it balances out. So suicide actually doesn't go down at all, but it's something to be uh, aware of. I see my time is up. I'll just finish this. Isolation. Depressed people have a tendency to get isolated. That even makes it worse. We'll talk about that more later. And a history of other mental illnesses. And so we will continue with part two tomorrow. I've kind of laid open the problem today, but there is a solution to the problem, and we will be getting to that uh, tomorrow. Thank you very much.